My name is Richard Lindemann. I'm director of the George J. Mitchell Department of Special Collections and Archives at Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine. What I've cho chosen for you today are some selections from our Oliver Otis Howard collection. It's one of the largest uh, collections that we have in the department, and it's the most heavily used. Uh, the reason that's so is that Howard's career documents so many different periods of American history that you can have people who are interested in the Indian Wars in the West or who are interested in the Civil War or interested in race relations, all coming to Bowdoin to look at these papers. Uh, and the only thing that they really have in common is that Oliver Otis Howard papers have resources that are useful for their research. Howard is a um, Bowdoin, first and foremost, is a Bowdoin alumnus, uh, class of 1850, was born in Maine, uh, uh, went on to uh, the rank of general uh, during the Civil War, uh, then became head of the Freedmen's Bureau, uh, was superintendent at West Point for a time, uh, was in charge of Indian Wars in the West for a while, uh, founded Howard University in Washington, D.C., as well as uh, Lincoln Memorial University in Tennessee, uh, and uh, uh, throughout his life uh, was engaged in those institutions that he had such a large part in forming. Uh, at Bowdoin, for instance, he was on the Board of Trustees for years and years. Uh, he served as president at both Howard and Lincoln Memorial University at different times of his life. Uh, was uh, awarded the Medal of Honor uh, for service uh, in the Civil War. Uh, really had a distinguished career in lots of different ways. What I pulled here are some images of him over time. Uh, early on, uh, he's a, a, a general by then, but still with a young countenance. Uh, and then uh, some older ones, including an interesting woodcut rendition of him that uh, reduces him to uh, simple elements, but provides for a grand portrait at the same time. Uh, a photograph here of him with uh, Chief Joseph, who was the chief of the Nez Perce tribe in uh, the Northwest, uh, where he was involved in Indian Wars and the relocation of those uh, tribe members uh, to the reservation. Uh, a rather imperious Howard uh, notice that his right arm is gone. He had it amputated uh, during the Civil War. Uh, and then sort of a Papa Howard uh, showing one of his sons and two of his grandsons, all of whom have followed him into military service. Uh, this is very, very late in life for him. And then finally, a, or penultimately, a group shot that in shows Howard sitting right there, uh, along with all of the great white men who at the time formed the, uh, uh, the visiting board uh, for Bowdoin College. Uh, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, uh, who also was of renown uh, through Civil War service, is also shown in this picture. Uh, he's right there. So those are the, the two gentlemen. Chamberlain and then Howard were two years apart. Uh, Chamberlain was class of 52, Howard was class of 50. Um, they seemed not to have interacted much uh, while they were here. They did share a dorm room, or a dorm, but not a dorm room. So uh, we don't really know. Uh, too much in their early years about whether they were friendly. Certainly later in life they were. And then finally, a picture of Howard along with other uh, distinguished alums, uh, including uh, Chief, uh, Chief Justice Fuller, who is seated uh, next to Howard there, who was also a member of the board at the time. This one gives a nice genteel notion of you know late 19th century uh, social life in a small town in, in Maine. This is a letter that Howard is writing to his son Guy on Christmas morning in 1861. Uh, Howard at the time is bivouacked at Camp California, which is just outside of uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, and it's a great, uh, uh, his son is probably three or four, maybe five years old at the time. Uh, and it's a great um, letter showing uh, a Civil War officer trying to be a father. Uh, the tone is very uh, paternal, but not in a patronizing way, in, a, in a, almost an avuncular way. Uh, lots of pictures, lots of uh, explanation about how things are. Uh, and in that sense, it also provides great documentation for camp life. So scholars who are trying to figure out the social history of the Civil War, what camp life was like, what everybody was doing when they weren't shooting at each other, uh, these letters to home are really great resources in that regard. This one shows a, a, a tent, uh, but with a with a built chimney on it. Um, 
People don't really associate built chimneys and tents necessarily together, but they happen all the time. And then on the back of the letter uh, is more camp scenery uh, together with portraits of, Ch of uh, Howard's family, including Guy to whom he's writing the letter. And then next to that is a picture of the general himself and then the other children in the family. And then who's this, of course, is Mama. This is in 1861, and then in 1862, in June, he's at Fair Oaks, and he gets shot. And a bullet, or a mini ball, don't know what, something penetrates his right elbow, and he has to be have his arm amputated. And so this is a set of letters and documents that document that event. One of them is a letter written to him from his brother, who was in Maine at the time, Roland Howard, saying, boy, I wish I could be with you. This is really not very good news, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but it's a very sanguine letter and uh, gives uh, an indication of how quickly news could travel. This is within days of Howard being injured, and already he's getting letters from home expressing condolences and concern. Uh, this is the transcription of the telegraph that was sent to inform uh, the Howard family in Maine that uh, he had been injured or been wounded and uh, then within a day is a letter from Howard back home written obviously with his left hand so you get a sense oh something's happened here uh, that he's well enough to want to write but that he also makes the good old college try of writing it left-handed because he doesn't really have any choices other than that. Uh, later, he was awarded the Medal of Honor for uh, service at Fair Oaks. About a year later, we have another letter from him, again to Guy. And so you can see he's sort of, sort of figured out how to write with his left hand. At least it's a legible letter now. Uh, and this is a great letter for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them is that he talks, about, he's in an encampment outside of Chattanooga at this point um, in anticipation of Sherman's march through Georgia. Uh, and he writes about uh, how guys should be working really hard at school and doing well at school uh, because all the kids around here, that is in southern Tennessee, they don't know how to read it, they don't know how to write. Um, they have to write with an X mark, so he shows an example of how an illiterate in Tennessee would be signing his name uh, just with the X and then having somebody else write what his name really was because he wasn't able to do so. And then there are uh, examples of more drawings, uh, what the to topography looked like, what his tent looked like. Uh, and the reason that this also uh, has some interest is that he's talking about the illiterates of, of Tennessee and later in his career uh, in the 1890s He's fundamental in establishing Lincoln Memorial University, which is established for two reasons. One of them is because uh, there's a need for education in Tennessee, and the other one is that there's a need for a memorial to Lincoln in the South. And so uh, uh, Howard puts those two sentiments together in forming this university, and then serves as its pre president in the 1890s. This is a, an oddball piece um, because it's signed by Jefferson Davis, whom Howard theoretically, if not actually, would be shooting against in a few years' time. Uh, Jefferson Davis was, of course, the Secretary of War before the Civil War. And this is Howard's commission as second lieutenant. After he graduated from Bowdoin, he went to West Point and uh, was a commissioned officer after uh, three years of being a student there. Jefferson Davis, oddly enough, was also uh, an honorary degree recipient at Bowdoin. After the Civil War, uh, Howard was appointed commissioner of the uh, Freedmen's Bureau. Here is a letter from Mary Shad Carey, uh, who is a, a black woman who is writing to Howard while Howard is at this time also coincidentally president of Howard University. Uh, he held both, both positions in the late 60s, early 70s, 1870s. Uh, he had been a founding father of Howard University. He and a group of others at a, at a Congregationalist church in Washington, D.C., uh, set about right after the Civil War uh, determining how they could provide help, particularly to blacks, but also to a, a variety of dis disadvantaged in the D.C. area. Uh, they initially established what was a uh, seminary 
and that very quickly morphed into a university. So Howard University was founded. In Indian affairs, he probably would not be considered a progressive. I mean, put him on the reservation was, would be okay with him. Uh, but in terms of his uh, treatment of blacks uh, and his involvement with blacks, um, he, he, he would, would have been. He's also called the Christian general because, depending on your perspective, he was either very pious or he was very righteous. Um, he did expect that his troops would comport themselves in the highest Christian manner, uh, but there are also suggestions that he was really preachy and maybe not the easiest guy to live with if what you really wanted to do was smoke a cigarette and have a drink. Uh, that righteousness, I think, or piety, depending on how you look at it, uh, carries with him throughout life, uh, and he makes no apologies for it. But he's also uh, singled out because of it, uh, certainly in many of the biographies that have been published since. Ultimately, I mentioned earlier that he was superintendent at West Point, but while he was still with the Freedmen's Bureau, the first blacks uh, were actually matriculated at West Point, were admitted. And here's a letter from Frederick Douglass in which he uh, writes to Howard in uh, 1880 that um, he appreciates Howard's sentiment and support for having blacks go to West Point. Uh, but later in the letter, he also sort of digresses into a very um, bitter uh, set of paragraphs uh, talking about uh, Christians aren't necessarily uh, the best people in the world to be uh, criticizing anybody else for how well they treat their, uh, their, uh, their brothers. And then later in life, he settles in to writing speeches, writing articles, writing addresses. And as an example of that, I just pulled out one that we have here, which is a text of an essay on the influence of women in the great conflict. So uh, later in life, he's, he's ruminating and reminiscing uh, and writing about how, what the role of, of the woman was uh, during the Civil War, you know, staying at home and taking care of the children or nursing the wounded or uh, providing letters that would build morale. But it occasionally also references uh, people who, um, women who had gone to the front lines when their uh, husbands were injured and taking care of them there. It gives the anecdote of a, of a wife who, when the pickets are established on both sides of an upcoming conflict, comes right down the middle and shoes away some people who are sort of stuck in the middle, in a sense. Uh, there's also a good anecdotal story about Howard when he loses his arm of um, being visited by a, another general who had lost his left arm. And the joke, of course, is, well, we could go glove shopping together. So uh, there's some humor in it, but it's a pretty tough time, really.